Hi, I'm Dr. Deborah Gentel. I'm again one of the co-directors of this conference, and I am moderating this next symposium. This next symposium is going to focus on the air pollution exposures in our region, as well as the health impacts. Um, I will be giving the first lecture, and it's entitled Impact of Air Pollution on Asthma Outcomes in Our Region. The objectives of this lecture are to provide an overview of the adverse health effects of air pollution. I am going to focus on PM 2.5 and sulfur dioxide, known as SO2. However, it's important to realize there are other air pollutants that do have health effects. We're going to review the known impact of air pollution on asthma outcomes, and that's going to include both short-term, which is our days, and long-term exposures, which are often months to years. I'm also going to summarize recent relevant research findings with a focus on asthma outcomes. I will be presenting to you on high rates of asthma prevalence and poor disease control among disparaged children residing near point sources of air pollution in our county. And I'm also going to be presenting some more recent data showing a near doubling in the amount of asthma attacks in Claritin residents following the Coke Works fire several years ago. Um, additionally, one of my colleagues will be presenting some of their data showing worsening asthma outcomes during that same time period. Finally, I'd like to end by discussing the unmet needs and I would like us to prioritize some of our action items moving forward. This slide is extremely relevant. Just in September of this year, the World Health Organization updated their threshold guidelines for exposure to PM 2.5. The World Health Organization recognizes that air pollution is now the single biggest threat to human health. And that's because it has significant impact on morbidity as well as mortality. So that's illness as well as death. And it also contributes a significant economic burden. And it's important to note that the World Health Organization also includes countries that have already decreased air pollution levels in this. Um, and we as the US certainly fall into that category. So even though we are cleaning up our levels of air pollution, we still have a ways to go. The World Health Organization has reiterated there are no safe levels of air pollution, and they've actually decreased both their PM 2.5 thresholds as well as their NO2 threshold. Their new long-term annual threshold has been decreased from 10 down to five micrograms per meter cubed, and that's a 50% slash. Their short-term or 24-hour PM 2.5 threshold has been decreased from 25 to 15 micrograms per meter cubed. The World Health Organization has also called for decreased NO2 thresholds, and they've decreased that long-term or annual threshold from 40 down to 10 micrograms per meter cubed. That's a 75% slash in that level. I just want to give a little bit of history about um, the evolution of air pollution control in the US. The Clean Air Act was um, adopted in 1970 and basically is comp comprehensive federal law that regulates air emissions from both stationary and mobile sources. It authorizes the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA to establish national ambient air quality standards. And the purpose of these standards is to both protect public health as well as welfare, and to also regulate emissions and hazardous air pollutions. Um, there are six criteria pollutants and they're all listed on the right-hand side of this slide. Again, I'm going to focus on particulate matter, PM 2.5 today, as well as sulfur di dioxide, SO2. And it's not to say that the others aren't important. These are just what I'm focusing on today. The others include nitric oxide, NO2 levels, ozone, known as NO3, carbon monoxide, CO, and lead, abbreviated PB. Most of, these, um, most of what I'm going to discuss comes from reference material from the US EPA, and it includes an update from uh, 2020, as well as an updated scientific um, assessment from 2019, as well as 2017. I want to just define the causality of adverse health effects. 
Um, the EPA has a very strict definition on how they define causal health effects. Um, a pollutant is considered causal if it results in negative health effects at relevant exposures based on studies encompassing multiple lines of evidence. And these type of studies include animal studies, test tube culture studies, human challenge studies, and epidemiologic studies. Causal is the highest level of causality that can be assigned by the EPA. And basically what they've done is they've ruled out any chance or confounding factors and biases. Um, so they're very certain that these pollutants are indeed causing the health effects. The next highest level of causality, according to the EPA, is likely to be causal. These studies show a relationship between pollutant exposure as well as negative health effects that aren't explained by chance confounding factors or biases. There's still a few uncertainties. That's not why, that's why these aren't called causal, but they're likely to be causal in the overall health effects. Um, some of that's due to the difficulty in assessing the effect of co-occurring pollutants. Uh, many of these pollutants um, are expelled into the air and breathe in um, simultaneously, so it's often hard to tease those things apart. Also, as time goes on, we're starting to learn that air pollution affects more diseases. Um, and so as time goes on and we're learning about this and collecting the data, we often have some limited or inconsistent evidence um, in those areas. Um, and over time that will be compensated for. I wanna summarize again, what the causality of adverse health effects are according to the EPA um, with regards to particulate matter as well as SO2. Uh, the EPA has defined a causal relationship between particulate matter 2.5 and short-term, which again is hours to days, as well as long-term months to years exposure and mortality and death. They've also defined a causal relationship between short-term and long-term exposure and cardiovascular effects. Additionally, for PM 2.5, the data shows that there's likely to be a causal relationship between short-term and long-term exposure to PM 2.5 and respiratory effects, long-term exposure to PM 2.5 and cancer, and long-term exposure to PM 2.5 and nervous system effects such as dementia. Sulfur dioxide has been shown to have a causal relationship um, as well. The EPA has determined there is a causal relationship between short-term exposure to sulfur dioxide and respiratory effects, particularly asthma. This slide just reviews how PM 2.5 or particulate matter less than 2.5 microns per meter cube causes adverse health effects. If you pay attention to the left hand of the slide, what you're seeing there is a human hair, which is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter. You're also looking at some fine beach sand pebbles, which are 90 micro, micrometers in diameter. The PM10, which is larger than the PM2.5, encompasses um, particles like dust, pollen, and mold. And you can see that they are depicted by the blue beads on the hair. And their size again is 10 micrometers or less. The PM 2.5 is even smaller. And again, this is in combustion particles, organic compounds, metals, et cetera. Uh, these are the red beads right on top of the blue beads. Um, you can see how very small these particles are. What happens is when we're inhaling PM 2.5, it's small enough that it actually gets down into our lungs and deep into our airways. And from there is actually able to cross the barrier from the lung into the blood and enter our circulation and go to distant organs and cause side effects and adverse health effects. Um, the larger particles actually don't act this way. Um, many of the larger particles are filtered out of our lungs, so they don't reach there. And that happens because we're breathing through our nose and our nasal passages are able to filter out a lot of those larger pieces of pollution. And also some of it will impact the back of our throat and be released that way so it won't make the lungs. Um, and that's why we're focusing on PM 2.5 today. Um, they're very small particles. 
they're not eliminated by our upper airway, they definitely get deep into the lungs or they can cross into the blood, circulate and cause distal um, effects on things like the heart and even the brain. I briefly want to review um, what asthma looks like. And I also want to talk to you about how sulfur dioxide can trigger asthma attacks. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide, we have a normal lung. And the schematic actually shows on the right-hand side an asthmatic lung. What happens in a normal person is their breathing tube, uh, depicted by blue, um, is like an upside down tree and it branches out um, into smaller tubes. And um, what happens in the normal lung is all those breathing tubes are wide open. Um, you see a cross section of one of the breathing tubes there on the normal lung side. And we all have muscles surrounding these breathing tubes. The muscle is relaxed if you don't have asthma, so the tube is wide open. The lining is normal. There's no inflammation or swelling, and there is some mucus. We all create mucus every day, and that's to help keep our airways healthy. But there's just a small layer of mucus in a normal airway. In contrast, in a patient with asthma, several things occur. First of all, when you're having an acute attack, those breathing muscles actually tighten and they make that breathing tube smaller. Patients will often say when they're having an attack, it's they're so tight that it feels like they're breathing through a straw. The other thing that happens is we have a lot of inflammation or swelling, and that also causes that breathing tube to thicken in size. And so that decreases the um, area that's available for air to enter in. And as part of that inflammation and swelling, we have a lot more mucus being produced and that in itself can plug the airways. Sulfur dioxide is known to cause asthma attacks. Basically, when you inhale sulfur dioxide, it's a gas form. As soon as it hits the lung lining or the mucosa, it's converted into reactive sulfites and sulfonase. And what these do, are they, actually, they are actually particles that now activate our sensory nerves. So the nerves that are controlling those muscles are going to tighten. Um, we also have a release of the inflammatory mediators or the swelling chemicals. And we also have an upregulation of what we call asthmatic inflammation. Patients with asthma often have a characteristic type of inflammatory pattern. And so that is upregulated during this process of exposure to SO2. All these things work together to cause tightening of those airway muscles, the swollen lining and that excess mucus production. So what we see is a patient having a bronchoconstriction, which is a tightening of the airway. And they also have airway hyperreactivity. What that means is that their breathing tubes are now more sensitive to other stimuli. So those could be things like allergens, respiratory infections, or even other irritants such as tobacco smoke. I'm going to briefly focus on some asthma facts right now. Um, asthma is a chronic disease. It's the number one chronic disease um, that contributes to childhood absenteeism in school. Um, it affects 25 million Americans, and overall that's about 8% of our citizens. It's um, accounts for 10 million doctor visits annually, 1.6 million emergency room visits annually, 180,000 hospitalizations annually, and unfortunately, we still have deaths annually, about 3,500. And that's very sad um, because we can't cure asthma, but we can certainly prevent exposure to triggers and then treat the disease that's there. Um, asthma has a tremendous financial impact on our society. It accounts for about 90 billion in total costs, and that includes direct health care costs and indirect costs such as missed work annually. Children are a very vulnerable population for asthma. And again, it's the most common chronic disease contributing to school absenteeism. I've worked with a lot of children throughout my career, and um, when asthma is not controlled, it means they're having frequent symptoms. Um, they're often not sleeping well at night. It's disrupting the whole family. Parents are missing work. The children are missing school. Um, these kids have absences, um, and it's shown that these absences can impact on their ability to learn, how they score on tests, 
and even their ability to enter post-secondary education, and it can ultimately impact their ability to get a paying job. A lot of these children also aren't active physically. As an asthma physician, my job is to control a patient's asthma so that they can run and play and do whatever they want. A lot of times these children have uncontrolled disease and they aren't able to participate in sports. And so they're sitting on the sidelines and not active um, physically. Um, this can lead them to long-term problems such as obesity, cardiovascular disease, and even diabetes. And also because these kids are missing school and they're having these physical limitations, some of them are embarrassed by their disease. They wanna hide their asthma. They don't want their friends to know they have a problem. It impacts their ability to socialize. So it has a tremendous impact on their life and well-being. I wanna talk a bit about asthma being a disease of disparities. Um, many chronic diseases of, or dis, have disparate, um, disparities with them. Asthma is not an exception. We find that African-Americans are five times more likely to visit emergency departments for asthma attacks. And unfortunately, African-Americans are three times more likely to die of asthma attacks. I want to take a few minutes to tell you that asthma is a multifactorial disease. I'm going to spend a lot of my time talking about air pollution effects on asthma. And I don't want anyone to walk away um, with the misperception that air pollution is the only cause of asthma. Um, we know that there are genetic factors to predispose us to having asthma. It's not as clear cut as a disease like sickle cell or cystic fibrosis where there's one gene controlling it. We think there's a variety of genes to contribute. Um, and for that reason, it does tend to run in families. We also know a variety of environmental exposures are involved in the development of asthma as well as in triggering asthma attacks. These include allergens, things like dust mite, uh, pet exposure, pollen exposure, mold exposure. We certainly know tobacco smoke exposure um, is involved in the development of asthma. And we know that respiratory infections are certainly involved in the development and triggering of attacks. And again, I'm gonna to focus today on outdoor air pollution. There's emerging evidence that nutrition and obesity also play a role. Uh, many people may not realize that but being obese is actually a very inflammatory, inflammatory or inflamed state. Um, fat tissue isn't just inactive. It's not just sitting there. It's actually making a lot of, of chemicals in our body that increase our likelihood of having inflammation or swelling. Uh, so there is a link between obesity and asthma. And certainly over the last several decades, there's been a lot of work done looking at the impact of psychological stress um, on asthma outcomes, particularly in the mom, um, in disparate communities. Um, these parents are often under a lot of stress, working several jobs. Um, they're worried about violence in their neighborhood. Um, you know, they're dealing with a sick child and that can feed back and cause worsening disease as well. We also know that for pediatrics, the timing of exposures are very relevant. We know that um, during the prenatal period, during the first several months of a baby's life, the immune system is developing and it is supposed to normally develop away from having allergies and asthma. But if there are certain exposures such as allergens and infections and tobacco smoke and even pollution, we see that that shift is not occurring and um, the immune system is swaying more toward the development of allergy and asthma. And there's a lot of interactions between these factors. I alluded to some of them above. There are many studies that have shown that um, there are synergistic actions between allergens and tobacco smoke, allergens and pollution, infection. All of these factors can interact to cause um, asthma. Briefly, I wanna go back to the EPA um, Integrated Science Assessment, uh, for particulate matter from 2019, as well as for sulfur oxides in 2017. The EPA clearly defines what the impact of outdoor air pollution is on asthma. Um, they have shown that short-term PM 2.5 decreases lung function, that's how well you can breathe. It also increases asthma symptoms and rescue medication use, which is an asthma inhaler called albuterol. We also know short-term PM 2.5 exposure increases emergency room visits and hospitalizations for asthma. 
Long-term PM 2.5 exposure, again, next months to years also has significant effects in asthma. We know that it decreases lung function. And unfortunately, in children, it can actually decrease their lung growth. So they may never achieve their total lung growth if they're exposed to air pollution while their lungs are growing. And that has a significant impact on disease in later life. It also increases the risk of developing asthma. Short-term SO2 exposure also has a variety of impacts on asthma. Um, it also decreases lung function. It increases symptoms of asthma, outpatient visits for attacks, as well as emergency room visits for attacks. And certainly there's increased hospitalizations for asthma related to short-term SO2 exposure. I wanna um, just spend a minute talking about children um, because they are a very vulnerable um, population um, for air pollution exposure. There are others that I'll talk about later in my presentation, but right now I wanna focus on children. They are very vulnerable to the impact of air pollution for several reasons. One, they actually get greater exposure than adults. And that's because their respiratory rate or how fast they're breathing is higher than an adult patient. Um, the other thing is, is their lung surface area, if you took their lungs and dissected them out and laid them out on a tennis court, their lung surface area is two to three times that of an adult. So you're bringing more of that polluted air in and it's hitting a larger surface area where it can be absorbed into their system. The other thing is children tend to be much more active outdoors um, so they can have a higher exposure that way. Um, and the other impact that I alluded to earlier is that their lungs are still developing. Um, and that development um, can be impaired by exposure to air pollution. And what happens then is their lungs may not achieve their full size and that impacts their ability um, to have normal respiratory function as adults. I'm gonna now turn to the impact of outdoor air pollution on childhood asthma in Allegheny County. Um, I'm gonna walk you through a study I recently published in the peer review literature. Um, and this is really just justifying why we did the study. Um, my group was actually involved in doing a lot of community and school-based outreach. And we were meeting school nurses and coaches that were telling us about half of their students had inhalers. I mean, this was some time ago, this was 10 to 12 years ago. Our group actually found that very hard to believe. Um, at the same time, um, you know, we've been having different reports of asthma capitals across the country, as well as American Lung Association rankings for air pollution. Um, we used to have a worse ranking um, for asthma capitals, but we're slowly improving. When I started this work, we were about in the mid 30s. We were ranking in the mid 30s out of 100 cities. Um, for being a, a poor asthma capital. Slowly we're improving. Right now with the updated asthma capitals um, guidelines, we rank 53 out of 100 cities. Um, we do receive average ranks for asthma prevalence, emergency department visits and deaths. Um, I actually don't think average is good enough. We are living in a city with two major health systems. Um, we have world-class experts in asthma. We have excellent treatments to control um, everyone's asthma. It's very rare that we see a patient who we can't control. So I really think living in Pittsburgh with our access to the healthcare system that we have, as well as the medications available, average isn't good enough. Um, the Asthma Capital Report actually cites Pittsburgh as being one of 15 cities out of 100 with high levels of air pollution. And additionally, they rank us as being ninth out of the 100 for the pollen impact. And this is important, and it's a little bit of a side discussion um, that really warrants its own conference. But air pollution over time has contributed to global warming. And one of the things we've seen with global warming is that our uh, growing seasons have become longer and actually peak higher. Um, so that's not true just for crops that um, we you know, eat, but it's also true for pollens. So our tree pollen, our grass pollen, and our wheat pollen seasons are all beginning earlier. They're lasting longer and they're peaking higher. And this is basically attributed to the fact that we have climate change, which is you know, contributed to by air pollution. Um, so again, these things do interact. 
Um, the other component um, to the um, rationale for doing this study is that for a long time, the American Lung Association has ranked our region, our metro region, is failing in their annual state of the air report. Um, again, at the time I started this work, um, it was earlier, about 10 years earlier, and the data I'm gonna show you is from about five years ago, but we were failing and we still continue to fail. Um, in our updated state of the air report for 2021, our Pittsburgh metro region, region received an F in three categories, and there's only three categories to be rated on. We're the ninth worst out of 199 regions for long-term PM 2.5 exposure. And all the other uh, regions ranking are on the West Coast. We're 16th worst out of, 100, uh, out of 216 for short-term PM 2.5 exposure. And we're the 35th worst out of 226 for ozone exposure. And again, I'm not spending as much time on ozone today, but it's also pollutant is known to contribute to adverse health effects including asthma. Um, the Allegheny County Health Department has done some work looking at asthma prevalence among the spirit adults and teens. Um, a few years ago, they did do a um, survey of adults and they showed that the prevalence among adults in our county um, of the spirit population, such as lower socioeconomic status, lower education, and um, people of color, they do have higher rates of asthma uh, compared to um, their adult counterparts. Um, they're actually reporting um, asthma prevalence in the upper teen to the low mid twenties for these different groups. And again, these include people of color, lower education, as well as um, lower socioeconomic status. Um, that report did not look at any children and it also didn't look at any um, of the triggers for disease. Um, they, in collaboration with the group at Children's Hospital Pittsburgh, did do a teen survey um, within the Pittsburgh public si school systems. And they did report very high rates of disparate, um, asthma disparities as well. Um, they showed that um, there were high rates of asthma, uh, again, in the um, lower 20 percentile for African-American teens in our region. Um, and that's important um, because we know from my earlier slide that only 8% of people are expected to have asthma. So the Allegheny County Health Department has some data on asthma prevalence in adults as well as teens and is showing high rates of disparity where the prevalence of asthma is two to three times higher than across um, the country and even across the county um, when you're looking at these disparate populations. Some of the shortcomings um, were that they didn't examine the asthma prevalence in the younger children. They also didn't look at disease control. As I said earlier, we have medications and environmental controls that we can teach patients so that we can prevent them from having asthma attacks. We can't cure their disease, but we can prevent problems. And it um, also didn't look at any specific environmental triggers, including air pollution. So that's really the background of why I did this study. What we did was we enrolled about 1,200 school children residing near point sources of outdoor air pollution in Allegheny County. The school districts participating included Clariton, Woodland Hills, Northgate, North Allegheny, and the Gateway School District in Monroeville. And they corresponded to the following point, point sources of air pollution in our county. The U.S. Steel Clariton Coke Works facility, the U.S. Steel Edgar Thompson Works in Braddock, um, at the time of the study, the DTE Energy um, Shenango Coke Works was um, operating and it did close after um, the study was completed. Um, also, the NRG Cheswick Generating Station north of the city was operational at the time um, of the study and they recently closed. And then finally, the children in Monroeville were um, located near the Monroeville PA Turnpike Junction, um, which causes a lot of traffic pollution exposure. This slide is just summarizing the demographics of those 1,200 children. Um, we focused on elementary children. Um, their mean age was 8.5 plus or minus 1.9 years. 51% were female. 52% were African American, and that's um, reflecting the higher rate of minorities in the areas um, near these point sources of pollution. 
and 61% were on public health insurance. And that's what we used as a surrogate for um, socioeconomic status. And again, that's higher because of the disparity of these patients or children living near these sources of pollution. 34% um, of these children are exposed to secondhand smoke. Uh, that's still a very high rate. Overall across the country, we think 20% are exposed. Um, this rate really hasn't budged in our region since I started doing this work over 20 years ago. Um, one of my earlier studies was looking at the impact of um, tobacco smoke exposure on immune responses in children with asthma. And at that time, I found about a third of the kids were exposed to secondhand smoke. And unfortunately, in this current study, it's the same. We did a little bit better um, than expected for obesity. In general, we think about a third of the children in the country are obese right now. We found that only 17% were obese in our study. We also um, teamed up with Dr. Albert Presto's um, group over at the Create Lab, I'm sorry, over at the Atmospheric Lab at Carnegie Mellon University. And we used his land use regression model to measure these children's annual air pollution exposure. Um, and basically this um, will give us um, a measurement of what the pollution exposure is down to the patient's street address. Um, and um, that uh, technology has been validated and is frequently used um, in the um, studies of looking at air pollution exposure on health outcomes. We found in our study um, that the median distance that these children resided from the nearest point source of pollution was 1.6 miles. And 25% of these kids resided within a mile of their nearest point source of pollution. On the right hand side, I'm just showing you the proximity of the Clarendon School building to the Clarendon Coke Works facility. That school itself is only 0.6 linear miles um, from that facility. Uh, some of these children literally live across the street from these point sources of pollution. Um, we looked at the number of children who had high levels of pollution exposure, again, using that land use regression model in collaboration with Dr. Presto's lab. We found that 40% of the children in our study had PM 2.5 exposure above the EPA standard of 12 micrograms per meter cube. That's a tremendous level of kids being exposed to pollution. Um, if you used a more um, stringent World Health Organization standard, at the time this paper was published, uh, we did not have the new WHO standards, the World Health Organization standards. Um, and the paper was published using the um, old standard of 10 micrograms per meter cube for PM 2.5. 70% of these kids were exposed to levels above that recommended by the World Health Organization. Um, because the World Health Organization has decreased their um, standard for PM 2.5 down to five micrograms per meter, I did ask the statistician to go back and take a look at, my, at the data we had collected. And the children who enrolled this study, again, 1,200 of these children living near point sources of pollution, every single one of them was exposed to PM 2.5 annual exposure above the new World Health Organization standard of five micrograms per meter cubed. Um, the lowest level exposure among the children in that study was 9.78. Um, so it was very close to um, what, he, what the prior standard had been and certainly no one achieved that level. So that's very alarming, um, the high rates of the pollution exposure in these kids. We looked at the overall asthma prevalence in these the cohort of children, and we used a very um, validated and accepted survey for this, and it's used across a variety of research programs in the US. 22.5% um, of the children enrolled in the study um, had a physician diagnosed as of asthma. And that again is alarming. That's two to three times the state and national prevalence of eight to 10%. Um, it's very consistent with what the Allegheny County Health Department reported for adults and teens who have um, disparities as far as their overall asthma rates are. But if you look at our whole county as a whole, the overall asthma prevalence is only 80%. Uh, so this is very striking and it's telling us that there are pockets of disease in these neighborhoods. Um, and again, these are disparate neighborhoods located next to point sources of pollution. We saw our highest rates of asthma in African-Americans, 
Um, we also saw it in older children, 10 to 12 years of age. And it makes sense. A lot of times physicians are reluctant to give an asthma diagnosis to younger children. So we do tend to see that. Um, the rate for children on public health insurance was very high. It was 26%. About 28% of the kids um, with asthma uh, did have secondhand tobacco smoke exposure. And 24% um, of them had annual PM 2.5 exposure above um, the 10 microgram per meter cube threshold, which was the World Health threshold at the time the study was conducted and published. Interestingly, our study showed no association with obesity. And that has been reported in some past studies that there is um, interaction between obesity and asthma, uh, but we did not see it in this cohort. We're actually able to go ahead and analyze the data. Um, we know that asthma occurs more frequently in boys versus girls. We know that it occurs more frequently in African-Americans versus non-minorities. And we know it occurs more frequently in patients of lower socioeconomic status. So what we're able to do is actually um, uh, a statistical model where we can account for those known demographic factors um, that contribute to asthma outcomes and really try to tease out what the environmental factors are contributing. Um, we basically found that air pollution um, was increasing the odds of asthma diagnosis in this study. The children had a 1.6 times increase of odds of asthma if they were exposed to PM 2.5 levels greater than 10 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, none of the other environmental factors were really panning out here. Again, obesity and tobacco smoke exposure. We can also look at interactions. Remember I told you earlier, air pollution can interact with other things. Exposure to nitric oxide um, did not in itself increase the rate of asthma in our study or the odds of asthma. But when you broke it down as an interaction in obese children, it did. The children who had the highest exposure, the highest quartile or the top 25th exposure to nitric oxide actually had a 2.5 times increase in asthma odds if they were obese. And we saw the same thing with sulfur. Um, Dr. Presto's um, system doesn't measure sulfur dioxide, it actually measures sulfur. Um, so what they found was an eight, what we found was an 1.8 times increase in the children again in that highest 25% exposure to sulfur if they were also on public health insurance, which again is a marker for lower socioeconomic status. Um, surprisingly, tobacco smoke didn't pan out after we adjusted for um, you know, the fact that more children um, with asthma are male, um, that they're also African-American, and they're also of lower socioeconomic status. What stood out was this air pollution exposure. Uh, we also looked at the prevalence of uncontrolled asthma, so our study found that 270 children had a physician diagnosis of asthma. And among those children, we found that almost 60% had uncontrolled disease. That means they're having symptoms of asthma more than twice a week, waking up more than twice a month with asthma, not participating in activities, and they're at risk of severe attacks that will require them to go to the doctor's office. Um, even the emergency room will possibly be admitted. This rate is twice the state prevalence of uncontrolled asthma, that's a 27%. And again, we looked at the different environmental factors and um, adjusted for those demographics, including gender, race, and socioeconomic status. And what we found was that air pollution increased the odds of uncontrolled asthma. In fact, that we found there was a five times increase in females um, with PM 2.5 exposure which it was greater than the World Health Organization threshold at the time of 10 micrograms per meter cubed. So this is the conclusions from that study. We have very high rates of asthma and poor disease control among the disparate children. And again, those are African-American children and poorer children who are exposed to high levels of outdoor air pollution from adjacent point sources of pollution. Uh, these re results are alarming, and I think they really underscore the need for several things to happen. Uh, number one, these, pa these patients live in environmental justice areas, and we need to do more to protect them from pollution exposure. Um, there's also a lot of work to be done with health equity 
I don't have time to talk about it today, but one of our speakers later, Dr. Brian uh, Stevens, will spend some time talking about how to approach these health equity barriers. Basically, these pa patients don't have the means to get to frequent doctor's visits to control their disease. Uh, there's transportation issues. There's issues with parents working multiple jobs. Um, and there are so many competing issues in their life that this is, you know, one of the things that they're not able to do. And um, I talked a bit about treatment of asthma throughout this. Um, again, we can't cure asthma, but we can control it. And the way we control it is by reducing exposure to known triggers, including air pollution. And we also control it with medications. Um, medications really come later down the line once you've been exposed and have the disease and are having exacerbations. And it can be a lifelong treatment. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with medications is that there are some side effects associated with them. In general, we feel that their risk outweighs, their benefit outweighs their risk as far as side effects occur, but they aren't um, without some side effects. So really what we need to do is to focus on primary prevention of asthma. And one of the easiest things for us to do is really reduce the exposure to outdoor air pollution, particularly in the high risk populations, these environmental justice populations. Um, and this is true for all chronic diseases. Um, you know, we want to focus on primary prevention, um, not coming in later and then treating a problem that's already there. Next, I want to turn my attention to the impact of the Claritin Coke Works fire that happened on December 24, 2018, on asthma outcomes in adults residing near Claritin. Um, there was a large fire at the Claritin Coke Works facility on Christmas Eve 2018 and it damaged pollution control equipment that remained unrepaired for several months. Um, so during this time, that pollution control equipment wasn't active. Um, the plant was still producing emissions. Uh, they had a 35 times increase in daily sulfur dioxide emissions during this period as they did before when the pollution control equipment was online. There were multiple days of pollution exceedances we saw four for PM 2.5 as the Liberty Monitor, which is the closest monitor there um, to that site. We also saw five for sulfur dioxide at that Liberty Monitor. Um, they were trying to divert some of these um, pollutants to the other facilities. So we actually saw exceedances uh, for sulfur dioxide as well as the North Braddock Monitor. And the map on the right is showing you um, the proximity of the Clarendon Coke Works, where it's located in Allegheny County, as well as the 15025 Clarendon zip code, um, which is the population we studied um, to look at the acute impact of the fire on asthma outcomes. What we found was a near doubling of asthma attacks in the aftermath of the Clarendon Coke Works fire. Um, I actually was able to um, look at acute visits for asthma among adults in the Claritin zip code to outpatient facilities. So those would be things such as a doctor's office, as well as urgent care centers. We were also able to look at emergency room visits for asthma among those results. Um, and I think it's important to remember going to the doctor or going to the ER is really um, the tip of the iceberg when you have asthma. Asthma is recognized as an outpatient disease. These patients all have action plans at home. So if they're having worsening symptoms, they have instructions on what to do um, as far as medications go to try to control uh, their disease. Many of these patients having attacks will call their physician's office and get phone advice before they are sick enough to even go into the office. Um, so really what you're looking at with the outpatient and ED visits is the tip of the iceberg here. These are those who are much sicker. Um, they're so sick that they do need to go to the doctor's office. So after the fire, we looked at the period from December 24th, 2018 to February 28th, 2019. And we used a comparison pre-fire period of the prior year um, as, as a control group. What we found was that the outpatient visits were 54 in a year prior to the fire. And, and that's again for asthma attacks in adults. Um, and it increased to 98 total visits and that zip code after. Um, so if you're looking at a parade of population, um, it's shown there as 5.6 versus 10.2 after, and that's a near doubling in the risk of an outpatient visit for asthma. 
Um, we saw the same thing with ED visits. There were 19 in a year before that time period for acute asthma attacks among adults and the clergy and zip code. And that doubled again, almost to 35 afterwards. Um, same thing if you add the visits up, of course, you're seeing 73 um, in the time period before with a near doubling to 133 after um, in the period when the pollution control equipment was offline. And again, that's a near doubling in the um, rate of asthma exacerbations. Um, we did a lot of analysis. We showed that these results weren't related to any weather impacts, such as temperature, wind direction, or wind speed, and even weather inversions. Um, which trap um, air pollution at ground level. And you'll hear a bit about that more later from one of our speakers. But we found that these results weren't related to the weather at all, including inversions. And we also looked at flu activity. Flu is a very well recognized trigger of asthma exacerbations. And flu is um, typically uh, circulating at this time of the year. And we found no um, impact of flu. If anything, we actually saw a worse flu season um, the year prior to the fire. Um, and these results of mine are very consistent with a uh, recently published study with our PIT colleagues, Dr. Wenzel's group. Um, their group um, is going to present next and they actually um, showed increased asthma symptoms and rescue medication in use in adults um, residing near the facility. Um, and interestingly, they showed that 50% of the patients enrolled in their study were unaware of the fire and these pollution exceedances. And this is something we're going to talk about more as the day progresses. Um, we really need to protect people by making them aware of when issues occur so that they can take protective actions. Um, and what I think the Clarendon Coke Works fire data shows is that we really do need a lot more policy initiatives. Uh, we need stronger regulations to decrease pollution. I think the fact that 50% of these patients were unaware of the fire and the exceedances, uh, that we need a better alert system to warn residents so that they can take protective action. And one of the other things I thought was lacking during this whole event was we really didn't have an organized response to assess, treat, and monitor health outcomes. Um, we know these people are at risk. We know these events can happen. I think it would be better to have an organized response um, so we can really in real time know what's going on instead of waiting for two years later for us to publish our academic studies. And I also think um, that our work with Claritin, um, the cohort spire shows these short-term impacts. Um, but if you review the literature, acute events like this do have long-term impacts on health. And, and right now there's not a lot being done to look at what those could be. So these are all areas for improvement. Before I conclude, um, I just wanna to touch upon some of the other impacts of outdoor air pollution. Um, I talked about children in environmental justice communities as being vulnerable populations. There are other vulnerable populations to air pollution. Um, certainly pregnant women fall into that category, the elderly, anyone with an underlying heart, um, underlying health condition. Um, I focused on asthma, but certainly if there's underlying health conditions such as um, heart disease, those predispose these patients. And I did talk about these children being uh, minority and poor, and we're gonna hear a lot more from, about that later um, from um, several of our speakers this afternoon. I didn't focus on the other pollutants. Again, I told you there are numerous uh, criteria air pollutants and I did focus on PM 2.5 and SO2. Um, I think here's a good example of um, high ozone days in the summer of 2021 um, that really show that other um, pollutants still have impacts as well. Um, and I think ozone is important because we're not in compliance in Allegheny County for that. We showed widespread health impacts in Allegheny County. Um, I looked at asthma. Other investigators in our area over the last several years have shown higher rates of mortality due to air pollution in our area, cardiovascular disease, respiratory diseases, uh, poor birth outcomes, and even autism. Um, and yes, um, recently Allegheny County did achieve compliance for the first time with the EPA um, annual PM 2.5 limits. Um, but the, the, one of the years that were included in that was 2020, and we overall across the country saw a decrease in air pollution exposure related to the pandemic. And unfortunately, the level we're down at still is nowhere near the levels the World Health Organization is calling for. Um, I also want to point out that there's a lot of synergism with air pollution and other triggers. 
um, and that includes COVID-19 infection that you heard about earlier. Um, it's documented that there's an 8% increase in COVID-19 mortality with each one microgram per meter increase in long-term PM 2.5 exposure. I want to end by saying our current standards do not protect the public health. Um, there are newer studies with larger populations that are reporting effects below our current EPA standards. Um, right now, we're showing that 13,500 to 52,100 annual deaths occur from long-term PM 2.5 exposure in the U.S., and that's more deaths than uh, are caused by flu each year. We're also seeing 1,200 to nearly 4,000 annual deaths from short-term PM 2.5 exposure. And I want to remind you that the World Health Organization tells us there's no evidence that any threshold of exposure to air pollution is protective of public health. Um, just like tobacco smoke, smoking one cigarette can harm your health. Any level of pollution exposure can harm your health. Um, there are recommendations. Um, the, um, there was a panel of PM um, 2.5. There was a panel of um, experts that were um, working with the EPA uh, to review these newer studies with these larger populations. Um, and they did have recommendations at the time to decrease long-term pollution as well as short-term pollution. Um, that panel was disbanded and they became independent and they did, did publish their findings and their recommendation in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020. They basically recommended that the decreased long-term PM 2.5 standard decrease from 12 down to 8 to 10 micrograms per meter annually. And they also recommended a decrease in the short-term PM 2.5 exposure from 35 down to 25 to 30 micrograms per meter cubed over 24 hours. The prior national administration rejected these recommendations and they weren't enacted. Um, the current administration is re-examining them and there is an expectation that these levels will decrease in the next several years. So again, we're gonna be right back to where we were. We currently um, were for the first time in compliance with PM 2.5. Again, that was reflective of the decrease overall air pollution in 2020 and the older standards of 12. So if we go down to eight to 10, we're gonna be nowhere near that. Um, we also are not in compliance currently for SO2 exposure and we aren't in compliance for ozone exposure. Um, so those are important things to point out. Overall, they recommend, um, they, they report that there would be a 21 to 70, 27 percent relative re risk reduction in annual deaths if we adopted a long-term PM 2.5 standard of 90 microgram per meter cubed annually. So in conclusion, I want to um, summarize that air pollution adversely impacts the health of Allegheny County residents. The current PM 2.5 standards are inadequate to protect public health and they are expected to be revised in the near future. We have a variety of action items that we do need to um, implement. We really need to continue um, to push regulations to decrease air pollution. We really need to work on an alert system to warn these vulnerable residents. Um, we need media alerts for those who don't have internet or smartphones. We need to give them specific advice. What are the strategies to protect your health during these events? And as one of our community um, representatives pointed out last week to me, we also, in these communities, these houses are older. Um, the outdoor air pollution gets indoors. We really need some airproof community shelters for these residents to go to during these times. Um, again, the real, the real issue, though, is to, to regulate so we're not having these problems and exposures in the first place. I also think we need an organized response to these events so we can be right on site as they occur, assessing, treating, and monitoring these health outcomes. And we need a health registry established. Um, we know these people are at risk uh, because of their um, environmental exposure and their proximity to these point sources. And we really need to um, follow them over time to understand what these short-term impacts are as well as the long-term impacts. Um, I thank you for your attention and I'm going to end there.